broadcasting in five seconds. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Madeline Milko, President and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, otherwise known as APEX. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our session of APEX in Conversation. Uh, we are excited to have with us um, the Honorable Norman Bay, who is the former United States um, Attorney for the District of New Mexico, the first Chinese American um, uh, United States Attorney, and um, the former Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And interviewing him today is Audrey Tauscher. She is a regulatory energy policy regulatory analyst um, with um, a special focus on supporting the Japanese and US energy industry um, as they forge relationships on a um, series of uh, mutual interest. So Audrey, thank you so much for interviewing Mr. Bay today and enjoy the session. Thank you, Madeline, and thank you, Norman. For those who are unfamiliar with your story, Norman, can you tell us how you started your career? Sure, uh, Audrey, and, and thank you for having me here today. And thank you, Madeline, as well. Um, so after graduating from law school, I clerked for a federal judge in Portland, Oregon, a judge on the Ninth Circuit. Um, then I uh, came back to Washington, D.C., um, where I was with the Office of Legal Advisor at the State Department. I did that for about two years, and then I went to the Justice Department, the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, where I was a federal prosecutor. I was there for about five years. And then I went back home to New Mexico, uh, where I had grown up, and um, was with the U.S. Attorney's Office there, uh, kind of rose through the ranks, became the U.S. Attorney uh, in the Clinton administration from 2000 to 2001. Um, after the 2000 election, of course, uh, appointed officials uh, leave when a new administration comes in. And I had this amazing opportunity to teach at the University of New Mexico Law School. And I did that for seven and a half years and in early 2009, um, had the opportunity uh, to come back to Washington uh, to be the director of the Office of Enforcement at FERC. And so I did that for five years and eventually um, I became the uh, chairman of FERC. President Obama made me the chairman of FERC and uh, you know, it was a great honor. I did that for, uh, from 2015 through 2017. And then uh, after leaving uh, FERC, I joined Wilkie, Farr and Gallagher, and I'm the head of their energy uh, regulatory uh, practice group. It's quite a career. Um, for those that are not in the energy industry, uh, FERC is not such a familiar government entity, um, but it did gain some notoriety in an episode of House of Cards. And in that episode, Vice President Frank Underwood asked you to investigate something on his political rivals. What did he ask you to investigate? And is that an accurate portrayal of what FERC can do? You know, Audrey, if I told you President Underwood would have you killed, uh, so <laughs> for, for your safety, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, but you know, uh, my guess is most Americans, when they heard the reference to FERC, um, had to look it up on Google. They, they were probably thinking, you know, what is FERC? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? What is it? Um, but uh, who knew uh, that FERC uh, could be, uh, you know, a tool in the uh, dirty tricks uh, a political toolkit? I, I feel like I've been cheated as the chairman, because I had no idea uh, that FERC, uh, you know, had such a uh, possibility. <laughs> well, I appreciate you protecting me from Frank Underwood. Can you um, maybe just say a little bit about what is FERC's mission? I know this is your past life, but it's still an important commission. Yes, yeah, so, so FERC has jurisdiction over the wholesale electricity and natural gas markets, as well as the uh, transmission of electricity and the interstate transportation of natural gas. It also has extensive authority over hydropower um, and over the interstate uh, shipment uh, or through pipelines of, of oil. Uh, finally, FERC has uh, responsibility to oversee the reliability of the grid the uh, uh, high voltage transmission system in the United States. So while it's not a well-known 
uh, agency outside uh, the energy uh, industry, uh, it actually is a very important agency. Yes, it is. And it, it's, it makes sure that we have reliable energy and also to make sure that the markets are fair. And while you were um, head of FERC's Office of Enforcement, um, unlike Frank Underwood, you did take on some very large corporations that you suspected were uh, manipulating the markets and your investigation resulted in them paying hundreds of millions in fines. So given your commitment to the mission of FERC and to uh, fair markets, it's not surprising that President Obama nominated you to head that commission. Uh, what do you think your greatest accomplishments were while you were head of the commission? So there are several things that I'm very proud of. Um, one is that um, while I was the chairman, uh, FERC issued a proposed rulemaking for energy storage and distributed energy resources uh, to enable both uh, to participate in the wholesale markets and to provide any services that they were technically capable of providing. I'm pleased to say that um, the energy storage part of that proposed rulemaking um, has become a final rule, although the DER part of the proposed rulemaking um, is still pending at FERC. Uh -huh. I would also say that uh, consistent with what uh, other uh, chairmen at FERC have done, um, I was uh, pleased to support the development of competitive wholesale markets and to work on improving uh, price formation in those markets. And that's really important, uh, particularly as we enter um, an age in which uh, increasing amounts of renewable energy uh, will be added to the grid and where you need to have flexible resources uh, to support uh, renewables. And finally, I would say that I, I'm very pleased uh, to have focused on um, employee satisfaction at FERC. Um, although this is not widely known outside the energy industry, uh, FERC uh, has this great staff and has consistently ranked pretty high in the federal employee viewpoint surveys. Well, I thought it was very important uh, given uh, the staff that FERC has uh, that it really tried to make the workplace uh, the best possible uh, workplace for its, uh, for its staff. And uh, so I, I put in place a number of measures that ultimately have resulted in FERC taking the top ranking among mid-sized agencies over the past few years. So, so I'm, very, I'm very pleased to have helped make that possible as well. That's a very big accomplishment. Um, having happy employees makes, makes the place run a lot better and makes policies go smoothly. Yeah, so. you know, I, I agree completely with you, Audrey. I mean, studies have shown that um, with respect to employee satisfaction, the two most important factors are first, doing something that is meaningful, doing something that matters, and second, being appreciated for what you do. And uh, certainly, um, you know, staff at FERC uh, have very important work and they deserve all the appreciation uh, that, uh, that one can give them uh, for the great work that they do. Absolutely, and I can I can attest to the fact that the staff are great because I have worked with them, met with them, and they've all been super helpful and and very committed to their jobs. So so thank you, Norman, for that. <laughs> oh, no, don't thank <laughs> thank them, Audrey. And they are they're incredibly dedicated to their jobs. They're very passionate about energy policy and furthering the public interest. They really are, and there's so much going on with energy policy now. So I think that people didn't realize how important energy was until recent years uh, with climate change and then energy security and reliability and all these uh, storms that we've been having. When the lights go out, then you realize how important energy is and the agencies that make sure that the electricity still travels to your light switch. Absolutely. And even this COVID crisis um, has shown how important it is to have uh, reliable electricity because you know we wouldn't be having, for example, this teleconference or this Zoom conference without electricity. Uh, and so you know, it's tough enough for people to have to hunker down, but 
it's impossible to imagine doing that without electricity. Right, right. All of a sudden, electricity is the hot topic. Um, well, climate change is also another big topic. And uh, in terms of climate change policy, uh, people usually think of the EPA. But as we said, energy is a big contributor to climate and plays a big role. So what is FERC's role in climate policy? It is often said, Audrey, that um, the EPA is the nation's environmental regulator and that FERC is the nation's economic regulator for the uh, energy uh, sector uh, because of FERC's responsibility to ensure just and reasonable rates in the wholesale markets. Um, that being said, uh, FERC, in my view, has a critical role uh, to play in, um, in combating uh, climate change by allowing for the use of cleaner resources such as renewables and in supporting a very important trend which is happening right now, uh, which is to say electrification. Uh, just about any um, policy study uh, that examines uh, decarbonization uh, has concluded that to really drive substantial progress, you have to decarbonize uh, the uh, production of electricity and then leverage that throughout the rest of the economy, uh, particularly surface transportation, whether it's electric vehicles uh, or freight trucks, um, industrial and commercial processes, and then space heating. And were that to happen, um, electricity demand uh, would increase pretty substantially over the next few decades. Um, so you would need to have the infrastructure in place to support that electrification. And FERC is an agency that is uniquely positioned to help uh, lay the foundation uh, for that electrification. Um, in fact, you know, one thing that's very interesting to see is that because of the uh, dramatic uh, changes to the resource mix in the United States, to the generation mix in the United States, um, in 2016, uh, for the first time in a long, long time, I think more than 30 years, uh, more carbon emissions were coming from the transportation sector uh, than the power sector. And, and that trend has been continuing. So it, it does give you a sense uh, for how dramatic the change has been um, and how um, you know, uh, one needs to not only tackle uh, emissions uh, from the power sector, uh, but then also from the transportation sector. Well, and I think that's really interesting because now we're at a place where the electric sector and the transportation sector are merging because with electric vehicles and now electric cars, I mean, cars are gonna run on electricity and then we're gonna have to put that power back into the grid to keep the transportation sector going. I think that's very interesting. And then um, it goes back to battery storage again, where you, when you were head of FERC, that you introduced a policy to break down barriers for batteries and batteries provide different services. They provide storage, but they also provide some backup, um, what's called ancillary services. So they can regulate the, the grid and make sure the power is flowing evenly. So do you think that uh, batteries from cars will eventually provide power back to the grid? I think that's uh, certainly something that many people have been talking about. Um, my understanding is that uh, presently there can be some concerns about uh, using a lithium ion battery, at least given the current state of the technology in that fashion, that you could wear out the batteries uh, pretty fast by doing that. Um, but that being said, there are certainly uh, more passive uses of EVs that could be very helpful. For example, um, uh, using EVs basically and charging them uh, during hours of the day when there is little load on a system and not charging them uh, during hours of the day when there is a lot of load. So, I mean, there are passive uses uh, of the battery systems and EVs that can still be very helpful, but a more dynamic, you know, vehicle to grid or V2G uh, approaches, and that's the acronym that you sometimes hear. I think that's a little bit off in the future and will depend upon uh, developments in battery storage technology. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And it also comes into play with um, future smart cities and smart grid. Absolutely. Which, Absolutely. Is, which is an interesting and exciting development um, that I think, you know, is destined. Yep. Um, what do you what innovative technologies do you think will be most important in the future? So you've already mentioned a few of them. Uh, I think energy storage, I think distributed energy resources, and not only in terms of, you know, batteries, uh, rooftop solar, uh, EV uh, charging, um, uh, but even in terms of demand, that is uh, the demand of, you know, uh, thousands upon thousands of homes and controlling that uh, through a smart thermostat uh, to reduce uh, the peak uh, during uh, peak conditions uh, on a system. I mean, I think that aggregated DR in that sense is very exciting. Yeah, no, I agree. And so not everyone understands what, what distributed energy resources is, and maybe you can explain um, you know, like roof from rooftop to, uh, solar panels on people's residential homes or or industries. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, traditionally, um, resources were located at the grid level. So you had a generator, uh, you had uh, uh, transmission that basically sent the electricity to the distribution system. I'm sorry, I seem to have lost my connection. I'm, oh, there, I'm back. Sorry about that. I lost my connection for a second. No worries. You know, I was checking I'm my in connection. West Virginia. You know, I was checking my connection too, Audrey. Oh. Uh, yeah, but to continue, so distributed energy resources, also known by the It would be an umbrella kind of technology that's making all of this possible, uh, given advances in wireless uh, communication, um, cloud computing, uh, advanced analytics, all of that. And, and finally, I would say, um, though not quite as important as the others, but still very important, um, grid enhancing technologies, advanced technologies such as uh, topology, optimization software, uh, dynamic line ratings, uh, basically uh, technology that enables you to optimize the capacity of existing uh, transmission infrastructure. That too, I think is very helpful. Yeah, and it's it's interesting and it's very exciting because some of that will allow um, more transmission to be not built so that you can reach communities that don't have easy access to electricity without having to build an actual physical transmission line. Nope. I think I've lost Norman again. Well, I'll just keep going uh, with electricity uh, topics because it is so important as, as we can see right now, if there's a problem with the connection, in this case, it's an internet connection, we can operate. And so that's why electricity is such a vital uh, product. Do we have Norman back yet? I can hear you, Audrey. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Now I can. Oh, great. I couldn't before. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Um, how do you think the energy industry will change as a result of COVID-19? And if so, how will it? How will it? Uh, certainly, there have already been some significant, um, dramatic, even short-term impacts. Um, who would have thought, for example, 
that the price of oil would ever go negative in the United States. And yet we've seen that uh, given the dramatic um, demand destruction uh, coupled with a glut of oil on the markets and, and a lack of storage space. Mm -hmm. So that, that is one very uh, profound short-term impact. Uh, with respect to renewables, some developers are having problems given disruptions uh, in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. There can also be problems with the work stoppage orders and um, with financing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I was uh, reading that uh, even EV uh, sales could be off as, as people uh, basically um, uh, you know, save their money and, and kind of reduce their spending. So th there are a number of short-term impacts. Um, th the harder question is what the medium and longer term impacts will be. Uh, certainly have, some have said that uh, this could give a renewed focus on climate change. It could give support to an infrastructure package that enables the build out of key infrastructure that can support uh, renewables or that can support renewables. Um, then, then, of course, um, you know, there could be other uh, implications. For example, uh, one thought I've been uh, considering is that um, whether or not what we've just seen uh, with the oil industry could be a glimpse into the future in a very fast forwarded way or fast motion way, but but a future in which um, there is much less demand and there's a lot of very cheap oil out there and, uh -huh. and, and overabundance of supply. Right. And uh, if so, I mean, uh, that, that may have implications for the big oil companies uh, and for others. Yeah, I mean, cheap oil is great for the consumer, but in the long term, it does very much hurt our US domestic producers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the United States recently became uh, the, the leading uh, producer uh, of, of oil and, uh, and we're a net uh, exporter at this point. Right. And so, yeah, low oil price uh, doesn't help the domestic uh, oil industry. Right. Well, um, electricity is a critical infrastructure service. So what do you think the electric utilities are doing right during this pandemic? Well, first, I think they deserve um, all of our appreciation uh, for keeping the lights on uh, during this very difficult time. I mean, some utilities have even basically um, uh, cabined staff uh, inside a facility uh, for a month at a time and longer to make sure that they don't have contact with people who could be infected with COVID-19. So some pretty extraordinary measures have been taken by the electric industry to keep the lights on. And, and for that, they deserve our appreciation. Um, longer term, uh, I think this um, could have FERC uh, considering whether there are other black swan type events uh, that the commission needs to be thinking about now because there is no substitute uh, for doing planning and preparation and having uh, the capability to respond, you know, when the uh, black swan appears. So, I, so if I were at FERC, I'd be thinking about other possible black swan events, whether it's GMD, whether it's a cyber attack, anything else that could jeopardize um, the grid. And if you go towards a future with more electrification, uh, it's more important than ever to make sure uh, that the grid is reliable. Uh, I would add that there's one other thing I'd be thinking about at FERC, and that is doing a technical conference to consider lessons learned uh, from the utility response uh, to COVID-19 and to see whether there's anything from um, the different responses across the country that can allow um, NERC and FERC uh, to issue some sort of best practices uh, manual um, in responding to this type of crisis. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And I hope they listen to you. Well, thank so you. I'm, I'm gonna switch a little bit more to sort of your personal background. Um, you worked in public service or academia for most of your career, and now you're in the private sector, still helping. Um, but I wanted to read some things that I thought were really 
uh, important and speak to who you are that uh, the late Senator Domenici had said during uh, one of your nomination hearings. So here are some of his quotes about Norman Bay. He typifies the American dream. He's the son of Chinese immigrants. He got a great education and a law degree from Harvard. And then he went on to teach at the University of Mexico. And while there, just like at FERC where your employees voted you the best uh, agency to work for, your students voted you as the best professor. So what do you think earned you that honor? Uh, honestly, Audrey, I think it's because back in the day, I was pretty good at foosball. <laughs> uh, UNM Law School had a foosball table, uh, 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 you know, uh, not far from the classrooms and not uncommonly, I won't say how often, I would, I would uh, engage in, in a game or two of foosball and, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of fun and uh, uh, I, I think the students en enjoyed the fact that I was playing foosball with them. But, you know, uh, beyond having a, a, a decent uh, push, pull, and pinch shot. Um, I, I like to think it's because uh, I, I tried to bring my A game to the classroom every day. Uh, that was one thing. Um, second, uh, I tried to make law school fun. And I know that sounds very kind of, uh, what, oxymoronic, uh, but, but, you know, behind every principle of law, behind every great case, there is incredible human drama. And so I wanted students to understand the way in which the law can profoundly impact uh, uh, people's lives, uh, why the law matters. Um, and finally, I think, you know, I, I tried, um, uh, you know, I cared about my students. I, I, I really wanted to see them develop as people and as professionals. And so maybe for those reasons, uh, they ended up giving me, uh, you know, this honor. I don't know. Well, that I mean, that's great. And I think that people pick up on sincerity and your, um, your real drive and, and making it fun, but also pointing out why it's important and the impact you can make really does resonate. So congratulations on that. Um, you were chairman of a federal agency, you served as a US attorney, and many suggest having Asian Americans at the highest level of government is important. So do you agree with that statement and why? I completely agree with that statement. And uh, I would even go beyond the statement to say that, um, you know, diversity matters. And um, it matters because um, you want to have a government that looks like uh, the people of, of this great country of ours, you know, in, in all of its uh, glory. And, and that means um, having a diverse uh, set of leaders. Um, you know, uh, not only does it make for better policy, but I also think that it confers more legitimacy upon government, which is particularly important uh, or critically important in a democracy so that uh, at the end of the day, um, you have the government uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people. You know, the famous a line from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And in the absence of diversity, I don't think you can achieve that uh, noble ideal. I couldn't agree more. Uh, absolutely. And we're still working on getting there. But, you know, we're getting there, little by we little. We are. Um, <laughs> You served in both the Clinton and the Obama administrations in different capabilities. Um, and are there leadership traits that stood out to you um, in those administrations? You know, uh, all of us have had the opportunity uh, throughout our, our lives uh, and careers to see both good leaders and bad leaders. And, and I've been very lucky to, because you can learn a lot from both, right? But I've been very, very lucky to see some some great leaders, and uh, from them, um, you know, I've developed my own philosophy in terms of what really matters. And very, very high up on the list, I would say number one on the list is having a commitment to doing the right thing. I, I think too often in this town, um, people ask the wrong question first. They say, "What's the political thing to do?" Right. 
And uh, that invariably takes you uh, to a bad place. Instead, you should be asking, what's the right thing to do? And then what's politically achievable now that I know what the right thing to do is? So I think that's really, really important. Um, I think humility is also very, very important. It's a highly underrated uh, trait in leaders, uh, but I actually think that the leader should be a servant. Uh, that uh, again, in this town, too many people who get an appointed office think it's about them, right? As opposed uh, to the office that they hold, the people they serve and the public interests that they should be furthering. Uh, so I think that's really important. I think integrity and honesty uh, are important. Um, and then of course, respect. Uh, respecting the people you work for and with, and then being appreciative of, of those uh, who help your agency achieve its mission. Yeah, very well said. So I'm gonna close with the um, standard APAC ending question, uh, which is an interesting one, is what does it mean to be a resilient leader? So in addition to all of the, the leadership qualities that I just mentioned, I think being a resilient leader uh, means being adaptable, being able uh, to take a step back, um, look at the big picture, um, ask the hard questions, and figure out uh, what you need to do uh, in order to kind of lead your agency uh, through a, a difficult period. Thank you, yeah, that's great. I agree with that. I'm gonna look at, uh, see if we have any questions for you. Let's see, do we have any questions? Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry, I guess, we're out of time. So my apologies to anyone who had any questions. Um, thank you so much, Norman. And I'll turn it back to you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Audrey and Norman for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your time um, on such a you know, wonderful topic during this time period, just because of the fact that I think um, a lot of people don't know what FERC is. And I think it's something that we hope to educate people on, on the agency and, and the work that it does. So I appreciate all of the, the input today. Um, just wanted to also remind folks for next week, we have our next Apex in Conversation on May 6th, the ne um, that's next Wednesday. The Honorable Patrick Shen, former uh, special counsel for immigration related um, unfair employment pr um, practices from the US Department of Justice. So please be sure to RSVP um, on the for the link uh, for that next apex and conversation. So thank you so much to everyone joining us today. Look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Norman.